Hollywood. It's the Tom Likas Show. This is your game now, gentlemen. And now. And now. Here he is. Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show on this very special guest. Special guest. The special and historic day in American history. Fortunately, I did not have to give an inauguration speech. All I had to do is come in and talk about somebody else giving an inauguration speech. By the way, speaking of which, did anybody see Barack Obama taking the oath today? Screwed it up twice. Screwed up his line. Biden screwed it up once. Obama screwed it up twice. That's he could he, he looked like he couldn't wait to get it over. He just wanted to be the president right now. Come on, go step it up. I'm the new president, baby. Let's go. <laughs> man, oh man, what a day! Is this a special day for you? Is anybody angry about this anymore? What happened to all those Sarah Palin supporters and the McCain supporters? Uh, they are noticeably absent. Even the Fox News Channel has toned things down. Have you noticed that? Fox News is uh, <laughs> pretty much laid off beating the crap out of Barack Obama. I thought for sure they'd be on all day beating the crap out of him. I think even they know what's good for them. Beating the crap out of such a popular president is not going to help their ratings at all. At all. So you got to wonder what's going on there. Anyway, um, the uh, the sad thing of course, about the inauguration of any president, is that, uh, generally speaking, with few exceptions, inaugurations take place Monday through Friday when people are at work. So most people do not actually see the events live unless they went to some screen. Uh, for example, here in Los Angeles, the uh, L.A. Live complex downtown had all their big screens turned on to inauguration coverage. Times Square in New York. There were big screens in places like Harlem which they kept showing on TV, and uh, other parts of the country. These are the ones they were showing. And the inaugural parade is still going on as I speak right now, unless you're listening to a tape of this program, in which case you're listening to a station that doesn't think our show is good enough to run it when it's live. But uh, sure enough, uh, it's all going on and on and on. And uh, tonight the inaugural balls will continue... uh, until well uh, into tomorrow morning. It's amazing stuff. So people were very emotional, weeping. Uh, were you one of those people? Were you weeping? Were you crying? Did you know anybody who took it so seriously? They just like were breaking down today. Did anybody go overboard with their uh, weepiness? Did anybody get overly emotional? A lot of people call it in sick today at work. Curious. Anyway, we are all Obama all the time for this edition of the Tom Likas Show at 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. David on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hey, Tom. How are you today? I'm doing okay. A um, couple comments, a couple thoughts regarding uh, this inauguration. Frankly, uh, the only thing that's historic about this is the fact that he's a black man. He has done absolutely nothing yet. And all well, well, by the way, so has every president ever inaugurated. Yeah, but it's just it's so funny. With, you know, based on what his uh, platform, which has changed, what's he really going to change? He's changed. You know, everything. I think. All presidents pretty well, much. Well, uh, let's let's start with he's closing down Guantanamo Bay. That's a change. Biggest mistake he could oh, ever. You, you make. said what change is he going to make? He's going to do all the things that that Bush did in the opposite way, and uh, the, the Bush left office with the lowest approval rating since Richard Nixon. Well, what I find amusing is that people are so anti-Bush when uh, you know if you just go back and look at the footage of nine eleven and see the people falling out of the buildings, we forget. You made a point earlier, and, I, and I'd like to reiterate that. You know, we we quickly forget uh, why we were in the Middle East and why we're defending ourselves and fighting for freedom and liberty. Well, but, but, but wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You just threw something in there. I was I was going along with you for a second, and then, then you threw something in. Uh, you know, being in Iraq has nothing to do with 9-11. Nothing. 
There were no weapons of mass destruction. The sign that said mission accomplished behind Bush was total baloney. Uh, when uh, Saddam Hussein was captured, uh, we were not done. We are still slogging along there in the middle of somebody else's civil war. Finding uh, Osama bin Laden has completely been forgotten in all of this. And uh, I would like you to tell me, I mean, do you really think that what we're doing in Iraq now has anything to do with 9-11? I think we went in there with a noble purpose, and that purpose was to go in and uh, disarm a dictator. Um, and he, don't forget, this is a man that killed hundreds of thousands of his own people. Uh, no different than Adolf Hitler or Stalin. And I think that was the number one thing that we did on a moral principle. Now, trying to spread democracy and freedom has always been one of the objections of the United States. And it's a pity, you know, was it a mistake going in? From a moral viewpoint, no. But well, from yes, a... because you know what? There's a lot of other Saddam Husseins out there. Uh, but we don't go into the Kim jong Ills of the world and others because we don't think we can win. Sure. That's why we don't go in. Uh, we went after Saddam Chinese. Hussein because uh, George W. Bush's father, George H. W. Bush, uh, was uh, threatened uh, by Saddam Hussein, and he had a personal axe to grind, and, and that is why we chose Iraq. Not because it had anything to do with 9-11 or weapons of mass destruction. That, these were lies that were told to the American people in order to justify going and dropping bombs on somebody to make us feel good, which we all did feel good until we realized we were bombing the wrong place. Yeah, that's true. Uh, what do you think, though, about closing Guantanamo? I, I don't believe the United States should be engaging in torture, especially uh, when, when not all of those people have been convicted of anything or are guilty of anything. Well, there's a lot of combat, enemy combatants there that are fighting us. And, yeah, and there are innocent people there. We don't know who's who. Well, I think that, uh, you know, when, i, I got to be honest with you. My viewpoint is if it protects one American or saves one American, then the, the hell with them. Yeah, but again, the fact is there's something called the Geneva Convention. There is a world court, and there's a world court of public opinion. All these other countries that you have a hard time getting to cooperate with you to go into places like Iraq, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we don't get a consensus. We don't care what other countries think about anything we do. The result is that when we need the help of other countries, they say, screw you, America, screw you. Well, it's a pity that somebody say screw you when we've been there for so many of them. Ah, uh, but, but, but in the days, uh, but let me tell you something. In the days of World War One, World War Two, we didn't tell the other countries, you do what we say or, or we're going to do whatever we want. We did things as a consensus back then. We had real friends. Italy was a friend. France was a friend. France was a friend. France gave us the Statue of Liberty. France was a The French architect designed Washington, D.C. I mean, the France was a friend of ours for a long time. You ever wonder why none of these countries are helpful to us anymore, are friendly with us anymore? I think that the majority of them had their empires first. They don't have the back horn, no, the stomach. Well, again, you, you bought into the, uh, the AM talk radio rhetoric of those morons. But uh, the, the real truth, if you've ever traveled to Europe and spoken to people. Multiple times. Um, all right, well, do you speak to people about this? Because they will tell you that what has changed between the United States and Europe and that there was a time when we would meet with the European countries and we would discuss with them what was the right thing to do and what was the wrong thing to do and we would try to come up with a consensus. What the United States did under George W. Bush especially is that we said, if you're not in with us, we're going to do it anyway and we don't care what you think. Then we went ahead and engaged in activities such as torture, which are specifically uh, banned by, by the Geneva Convention. We went and did them anyway. Well, it's called waterboarding, and I don't know that that's necessarily... Uh, well, see, again, you, you, how about... How about you don't know that it's necessarily... What you do is, you, in the old days, we'd sit down with France and Italy and England and Spain. You'd sit and have a conversation with those countries, and you'd see Germany, and you'd see what, what, what they thought. We don't do that anymore. So then when you want your planes when you want your planes to take off from France in an emergency and they say no, how can you get all huffy about it? Did you ask France for any uh, <laughs> input or advice on anything else you've done? Well, I, I honestly just believe as far as Gitmo is concerned that, you know, it's a place to hold these people. The problem with the Arab mentality 
and especially you know Al Qaeda and all them is they hide behind the Geneva Convention and they use it against us. They're not members. Of, they're not a a, a a a identified government, which is what the Geneva Convention is for. It's not. They're not. You know, they're terrorists. And they hide behind that, and now sit there and think that we're going to have to give them equal rights under American law when they're combatants. Well, we're talking more about we're them. talking more about world law is what we're talking about, and uh, you know I think Barack Obama is going to go back to getting a consensus from other countries, and the result is we're going to get more cooperation from other countries, not what we've had the last few years. David, thanks for the call. Tom Lincoln. One eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. One eight hundred five eight hundred eight six six. The Tom Likes Show. For everywhere we look, there is work to be done. The state of our economy calls for action, bold and swift, and we will act. Not only to create new jobs, but to lay a new foundation for growth. We will build the roads and bridges the electric grids and digital lines that feed our commerce and bind us together. We will restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonders to raise health care's quality and lower its cost. We will harness the sun and the winds and the soil to fuel our cars and run our factories, and we will transform our schools and colleges and universities to meet the demands of a new age. All this we can do. All this we will do. Barack Obama, speaking shortly after his swearing-in today at about 12.30 Eastern Time. Well, look at this. We were just talking about this. Barack Obama took the 35-word oath of office to become the United States' 44th president today, even if he had been, may have been led to utter the historic words of the wrong order. Obama was sworn in by Supreme Court Justice John Roberts, resting his left hand on Abraham Lincoln's Bible and raising his right hand to deliver the words that formerly made him the successor to former President George W. Bush. But things didn't go exactly as planned for the swearing-in of the country's first African-American commander-in-chief. Under the gaze of more than two million crowded onto Washington's National Mall and millions more around the world, Obama said, I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the office of President of the United States faithfully and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. As specified in the United States Constitution, the word faithfully precedes the phrase, execute the office. But the Chief Justice, in his first presidential inauguration, read that part of the oath incorrectly. Obama paused, apparently realizing something was wrong, and after an awkward moment, Roberts repeated himself, but the Chief Justice stumbled again. Obama eventually recited the line as Roberts originally said it. Huge crowds watching the historic proceedings one mile down the National Mall on a jumbo TV screen groaned loudly after Robert's gaff. Oh, no, 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 one woman screamed above the murmuring crowd. Unbelievable. 1-800-5800-TOM, that's our telephone number. This is Daniel on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. How are you doing today, Tom? Doing great. Uh, Tom, man, I am frustrated. I'm pissed off that people actually believe this dude's going to save this country. This dude comes over here and he says that he wants to stop the war in Iraq. Now, he wants to stop war in 2009, but he wants to go to Afghanistan and start a war. The dude lies right there, Tom. Then the dude's going to say he wants to help the people and he's going to protect the Constitution. But have people not been paying attention that the Obama administration wants to take our Second Amendment away to bear arm and have a gun control? What is this, Tom? Well, uh, Daniel, first of all, you have to understand, no president acts alone. You know, Bill Clinton came into office wanting to do all kinds of things he never did. Gays were going to be uh, approved in the military uh, to serve, and then they came up with that stupid don't ask, don't tell policy. Uh, of course, uh, Bill Clinton was going to uh, nationalize health care. Never happened. It doesn't really matter what the president wants to do. What matters is what the president uh, achieves in cooperation with Congress. Exactly. And you and me both know that he hasn't made decisions. Just like Bush, people think, oh, Bush put this in a situation. It wasn't Bush that put this in a situation like this. 
People in Congress. Well, wait, 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 wait. What situation are we talking about? The situation of how bad the economy is. And I'm going to tell you something too. Really? Tom. You think yeah. so? So, oh, so oh, do you oh, think? Man, so think you believe you believe that the president did a good job with the Securities and Exchange Commission? That uh, the people who were appointed there were the right people. They did a good job, for example, in the Bernard Madoff case or the Enron case or countless other cases where uh, people invested their hard-earned money and lost everything they had. You think the president did a good job there? I think what the government does is just crap. I mean, if you look at half the stuff that they approve today, man, it's just, it's amazing that people aren't opening their eyes to this. I mean, you probably think, I mean, you hear about the 9-11 conspiracy. Be specific. Okay, like, like, let me tell you something. Uh, the microchips. Have you heard about those microchips that they put in animals? To like you know you you can you find your cat or your yeah, dog. Yeah, this is right? your biggest concern today. Okay, right. They put this. In this is your biggest people, right? concern today. No, no, it's not the biggest concern, Tom. But these are little. I mean, we the country is going broke. The country not no. It is, we passed going broke a long time ago. Oh yeah, Tom. The and country we, is broke, oh, and this is your biggest with. concern. No, my biggest concern. I, I, is, I, really don't don't get me started. One eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. That's our telephone number. Let's say hello here to Brian on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hey Tom, how are you? Doing great. That guy. That guy was an idiot. Uh, anyway, I wanted to ask what you, what you know about Obama's stance on decriminalization of marijuana. We've talked about that. this on the air before. I have not heard one word from Barack Obama about drugs. Not one word. Yeah, me neither. That's why I was wondering if you thought, you know, you know, you've, oh, you've always heard how legalizing it would help the economy and inject a bunch of money and new business and things like that. And I don't think it's going to happen with Obama, but do you think he could do anything to maybe push it forward a bit? Well, do uh, I think he could? But he could do a lot of things. Do I think it's a priority? No. You don't think he would at all? I didn't say I don't think he would at all. I said I don't think it's a priority. Okay. I mean, keeping the country from from just uh, putting up the going out of business sign is his priority right now. I feel you on that. I mean, right now, the country looks like a big circuit city. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Well, right. some, looks like a big, it looks like a big Mervyn's. <laughs> yeah, I'll take you out with a bong rip. Here you go. It's one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom, and uh, let's continue here with uh, look at all these calls. Wow. Let's uh, say hi to Joe on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hey, hey, Dad, how you doing? Doing okay, son. Yeah, hey, uh, what do you call the thing about Obama? I mean, yeah, I'll give the guy a fair chance. He's he's pretty optimistic, you know, but we got to give him the benefit of the doubt. He's only human, and every other president in, you know, the history of the United States always promised something and always fell short elsewhere. You know, so I'll give him a fair chance just like everybody else. But I, I can't keep... Uh, you know, bending around the fact that, you know, a lot of the people I've spoken to and asked them about his policies, and for some reason... From what I got, it always seemed like, you know, they picked him based on the, uh, you know, the color of his skin, you know, which is their, you know, their their facts or whatever and stuff. Uh, but I also heard you talking earlier about Iraq. Um, see, I'm a serviceman, and uh, I'm working now at the uh, VA in uh, West L.A., and I was in Afghanistan, and I was in Iraq. Matter of fact, I earned a Purple Heart in Iraq. Now, when I was in Afghanistan, we did uncover, you know, um, uh, like notes, uh, letters mailed to uh, certain people, you know, uh, coming from Iran that were getting rerouted to Iraq. Now, necessarily saying that Iraq had a, um, something to deal with 9-11 or all that, you know, I'm not at liberty to say. Or, you know, I'm not even going to get into it. But um, just a quick note, you know, yeah, a lot of people are disapproving of the Iraq thing. But a lot of people fail to realize that it took us about four or five months, be, you know, the whole, uh, between the whole deliberation between the U.N. to allow U.N. weapons inspectors into Iraq to, you know, go ahead and search for, you know, so-called weapons. I'm not, I'm not even looking back. I mean, we're still there today. Exactly. I, no, I'm not even talking about what, you know, when the weapons inspectors got there, when they were allowed to go in. Let's right. let's say all of that was reasonable. We got well, in. We found there were no weapons of mass destruction. Time to go. Yeah, true. True, exactly. But true. we are still there, spending $10 billion a month. 
Right. And that's one more point I wanted to get on. A lot of people are pointing the finger at President Bush. Yeah, he did mess up, but then you got to look at this. I mean, he's not the only one running the government. There was a congressional... He was the commander-in-chief. You remember the sign, uh, the, the buck stops here on the president's yeah. desk? That <laughs> that's, doesn't matter who else. Yeah, the guy, Here's the guy who was responsible for bringing in the cabinet. Uh, the, here's the guy who brought in the uh, Secretary of Defense, right. the Vice President, and all the other people advising him. Exactly. So he has to take responsibility. Right, that's true. Um, also, there's, okay, um, like, I don't know if you're uh, really familiar with uh, military terminology, but the military ha now has an SOP, a standing operating procedure, stating, and this was, uh, I think this was delivered down by Congress, that all uh, U.S. Convoys in Iraq must let um, Iraqi uh, civilian uh, vehicles within the convoy. Now, what's the dilemma there? I.e., you know, VBIDs, car bombs, you know, all kinds of things, and it causes a big, you know, uh, a big uproar, and and soldiers are dying because of that. And it's it's not directly President Bush saying, "Hey, okay, well, you guys got to do this." I mean, it's the whole team. It's a it's a team effort. And like President Obama said earlier today in his inaugurational speech, that you know, um, what do you call? We all got to get together and he mentioned you know the katrina relief and that's true because i was working for uh blackwater you know for the katrina relief and everybody there was you know at each other's throats and you know there's do no... you think brownie did a good job yeah you know and I do, don't do, know. That's, that's a question for you do you think brownie did a great job that's excuse me brownie the head of fema oh you uh, commander in no, that, from that. what I understand, though, uh, from what I looked into it, uh, I read somewhere that it's the state's responsibility to request for FEMA assistance. Now, I'm not too sure how true that is, but if that's the case, well, then uh, Kathleen Blanco... Why does, why, does, why does Bush say he has regrets about his response to Katrina? Yeah, it's, it's all... Well, they knew it was coming, so they should have been standing ready. But then the state has a lot to deal with it, too. You know, so I'm, I'm not throwing blame in anywhere. We'll just... The president himself said in, in one of the interviews uh, before leaving uh, office that that's one of his regrets, not acting faster. Yeah. So if he feels that way, why would you disagree? Well, um, because, like, uh, I also read that for the, the FEMA outline that it's the state's responsibility to... But the president, it doesn't matter what the responsibility is. The president said that that was one of his regrets. <laughs> True. I, I think he, he does regret it. No, uh, now knowing that Kathleen Blanco would have, you know, kind of like waited on, you know, requesting for assistance. But, you know, if, if President Bush is going to take the fall for that one, then okay, you know, slap yeah. a whole more than a you slap. Got, you got it. You got to go along with it. Tom one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom Tom one eight hundred five eight hundred eight six six. The Tom Likas Show. As for our common defense, we reject as false the choice between our safety and our ideals. Our founding fathers, our founding fathers faced with perils that we can scarcely imagine, drafted a charter to assure the rule of law and the rights of man, a charter expanded by the blood of generations. Those ideals still light the world. And we will not give them up for expedience's sake. Your new president, Barack Obama. And we are all Obama all the time at 1-800-5-800-TOM. At least for this particular edition of the Tom Likas Show. It's John. Hello. Hey, Tom. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. First time, long time. Thank you. Uh, I'm calling because I'm frustrated with these television, television networks. I was channel surfing this morning to catch the the best coverage, and I couldn't help but notice how how right wing Fox News could be. They are just they are a reign over happiness towards everybody. I couldn't help but just uh, throw my TV out the window when I heard um, Shepard Smith this morning talking about um, it's going to be about $4 billion, this parade and the inauguration and all this. And he talks up to the next guy, well, it's going to come out of taxpayers' money. You know that, right? And it's just terrible how you could just ruin such a, such a happy day for so many people. 
Was anybody watching Fox News except you today? I mean, let's face it. Fox, we talked about things that, that seem dated now, like Starbucks and, uh, you know, shopping malls. We get a show like that. And isn't the Fox News channel one of those things? Like, uh, hasn't their day passed by now? No. You don't think so? I'm sorry, what was, it? what was that? All right, you go smoke another bowl and call us back, all right? one eight hundred five eight hundred. 800 tom that's our telephone number. Derek, on the Tom Likas Show, hello. Hey, Tom, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Dude, not only is Bush a clown, but so are his appointees, right? Chief Justice Roberts, not only did he mangle the words to the oath, right, which is embedded in the Constitution, and supposedly he used to be like a Constitution uh, professor or something like that, so, you know, he must have been swigging whiskey or something this morning. Another thing that, um, you know, I haven't heard in the media yet is that, um, you know, if you, if you notice, he first addressed Obama as senator, right? He's like, oh, are you ready, senator? And then Obama said yes. But the reality is that a week or two ago, Obama resigned as senator, and now the junior senator from Illinois is uh, Roland Burris, right? Now, you know, like you said, we shouldn't be... Focused well, on there are people who call... Wait, 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 wait. That, that's nitpicking because there are people who call Bill Clinton Mr. President. Uh, he's not the president, and he hasn't been the president of the United States since 2001. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. It's kind of, you know, being uh, anal, I guess. But, you know, it's kind of an embarrassment because, you know, the scene is being broadcast worldwide, and, you know, the chief justice can't even get the damn words right, and, you know, Obama has to pause because Obama is also a constitutional uh, professor. He knows that something's not right, you know. But, you know, like you said, we got to focus on bigger and better things, and uh, hopefully the next four to eight years will be uh, a better time for our country. I would like you to take me out to uh, the Grand Stooge Bill O'Reilly style, please. Bill O'Reilly style. Here you go. I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. No. We'll do it live. It. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. And thing sucks. Now we have the swearing in of Barack Obama and the screw up. <laughs> and uh, here's what it sounded like in case you didn't hear this live. It's my distinct honor to present the Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable John G. Roberts Jr., who will administer the presidential oath of office. Everyone, please stand. Are you prepared to take the oath, Senator? I am. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do I, Barack, solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. That I will execute the office of President to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the president office of President of the, the United States. The office of President of the United States faithfully. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you, God. So help me, God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Walter on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hey, how you doing, Tom? All right, how you doing? Long time. Thank First you, time. Walter. All right, how you been, man? I've been great. All right, that's good. That's good. You know what got me going, Tom? Is how he purposely tried to make him mess that inauguration up. That made, it was unbelievable. Like pretty, said, pretty, soon, it, pretty soon, pretty soon, Sean Hattie will be on going, he's not really the president. He, oh, he, he didn't actually take the take. oath of office. That's all he's going to take. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm looking at it well down the line. I'm looking at it well down the line to where it's the point where it's, 30, 20 years later, and there still hasn't been a black president. Due to the rewordage of the inauguration, it never was official. Even if it's two years, one year, six months, just a long enough time to where, you know what, we can get you out of here. Yeah, well, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I, it's fun to talk about it, uh, but this is being certified six ways from Sunday, and the American people would not stand for that, uh, nor would Congress. You're going to have a Democratic uh, majority in Congress, and uh, don't worry, Barack Obama is the president uh, until he's done. 
had, I, I, and, and, and he and he made sure of that. That's why the man is so bright. He made sure of that. He didn't go up there not knowing what needed to be said. He didn't go up there too nervous to be able to say, well, maybe I'm tripping. No, he believed in himself, which everyone should do, which I've been doing. I listen to you, Tom, off and on, but every time when it's time to come back, and I'm just riding home now, and I said, I wonder what Tom got to say. I haven't watched the inauguration yet. It's recorded. I'll watch it later. But I'm saying, let me see what Tom got going on on his show. He always got my attention. I, I fall that. off, but I always come back, Tom. I love that, Walt. Do you come back any time? All right, now. <laughs> take me out however you want to take me out. Well, all right. We always go old school on one of those. 1-800-5800-TOM. It's our telephone number. Kareem is listening to us on our online stream. He's in Southfield, Michigan on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hello, Tom. Hello, Kareem. Tom, as, as always, it's a pleasure, pleasure to listen to you, pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. I, I am so happy as, as a young black man to uh, have seen the inauguration speech today. And me and my friends just, just fell on the floor laughing when we saw the first black president hop in his Cadillac and drive off or, or get driven off. <laughs> 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 only, the only thing was missing was some, some, some rims. That's right. On that. <laughs> All that was missing was Jay-Z, for God's sake. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, you, I, Jay, by the way, he he outdid Jay Z in whatever car Jay Z is currently driving. Did you see that Cadillac? Did you oh, see it that was, car? <laughs> it, 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 it was nice, and, and I always hated. The you know, I live down the block from Kanye. I think he put an order in for one of those today. As a matter of fact. Yeah, I, I've never liked the presidential limo. They always look like hearses, but his was sweet. Yeah, that had to be the rockinest presidential limousine I've ever seen. Yeah, uh, but as far as the speech, you know, I, I pretty much agree with everything he said, except for when he hit it to the torture issue. You know, I, I'm pro torture. I think that there might be situations in where America is you justified. are pro torture. Yeah, America is justified to, uh, <laughs> you know, use a little pain to get information out. Yeah, well, what about uh, using it uh, against innocent people? Well. That, you know, that's always a problem, but... Yeah, it's a big the, problem, and the rest of the world doesn't really look kindly upon taking innocent people and torturing them. Well, uh, well see, I don't know all, all the facts around the torture. And, and, and the other thing is somebody... that the, the United States loves uh, criticizing the torture of other countries. We love interfering in the business of other countries who've committed torturous acts to, to, to their people. Yeah, well, we we always do that. We we are a hypocritical nation. You know that, Tom. Yeah, well, but we're not you know, we're not in a position we, to be critical of other countries if we're doing it ourselves. Yeah, you're right about that. But if we if we capture somebody on the battlefield, and we have reason to believe that they may have sensitive information, playing good cop bad cop is not going to work. Then I really don't have a problem. My problem with it was why in the hell did the CIA videotape it? What are they going to do? Put it on their MySpace page? <laughs> I mean, come it's on, not, it's going to be on YouTube. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Tom. It was a pleasure. Take me out of Elliot Spitzer style. Elliot Spitzer style. All right, Kareem, here you go. Number nine. The remorse I feel will always be with me. From those to whom much is given, much is expected. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. It's one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. It's our telephone number. We're all Obama all the time today. Tom like it. One eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. Tom like it. One eight hundred five eight hundred eight six six. The Tom Likes Show. This is ninety seven one FM Talk. 97.1 FM Talk congratulates President Barack Obama. We are and always will be the United States of America. It's the answer spoken by young and old, rich and poor, Democrat and Republican, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, gay, straight, disabled and not disabled. Here's to our nation finally coming together the way it was meant to be. I promise you, we as a people will get there. From Hollywood, it's the Tom Likas Show. I'm 1 800 5800 Tom. It's our telephone number. Here we are on the day of the swearing in of our 44th president. Actually, our 43rd, because they kind of go over, over Cleveland twice. 
God only knows why. They say it's because he served to two separate terms. They were not contiguous. Why would you count him as two different presidents? Makes no sense. So they say he's the 44th president of the United States. We'll go along with that. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Brandon on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hello, Tom. I was just I, I just wanted to call. You, i got to say, you have some of the dumbest callers in the world. Somebody was calling earlier and saying... I wouldn't be so hard on myself if I were you, Brandon. Uh, you sound at least of average intelligence to me. I didn't say all. I said some. Ah. Uh, somebody was making a comment earlier about how uh, the blacks had voted Barack in, and the blacks were making comments, and they had only voted for Barack because he was black. And I just wanted to let everybody know, even though we live in the Boulia Bays of Southern California, blacks only represent 13% of the population, and more than 51% voted Barack Obama in. So while I have a, a large audience, everybody can know that it's not just the blacks that voted Barack Obama in. Well, we in fact, if, o if only blacks voted for Barack Obama, he would not be president today. Absolutely, my point. So there you go. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Let's say hello to Tim on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hey, Tom. How you doing? I'm okay. Hey, I just want to say I like your show. I just got into it a couple months ago because I just moved out here. But I uh, enjoy listening to it when I'm in my car on the way home. Uh, a couple things I wanted to bring up is, one, how come we're not making a bigger deal about a $170 million inauguration during a time of quote unquote economic. Well, first of all, uh, I don't know how much tax money is being spent, but the whole $170 billion is not coming out of tax money. In fact, most of it I don't believe is. Uh, my understanding, based on my reading, is that uh, it's paid for by things like this inaugural committee, to which uh, contributors like uh, uh, Steven Spielberg and others uh, voluntarily contributed. Um, and and even, even so, Tom. Uh, you know, well, wait a minute. Don't don't even do, wait 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 wait. Don't even sow me. You just said the taxpayer spent 170 million dollars, and when I start to break it down for you and prove to you that the taxpayer didn't, then you start oh, with even so. I'm not saying taxpayers. I'm just saying money in general. Wouldn't it be for for someone preaching change? And I and I'm actually an Obama supporter, so I'm just curious of the situation. For someone preaching change, wouldn't a great would, wouldn't a great first step would have been saying. You know, this money could go to something else. There could be a lot of other things. I just don't understand why there isn't as much of a, a deal about it, considering that's a... I think, I money. think, I do think, uh, well, look, when you see how many people showed up in Washington in our lifetime, and this includes, uh, depending on how old you are, the Kennedy inauguration, the uh, 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 Reagan inaugurations, the uh, Clinton inaugurations. And these are the presidents people have felt best about uh, over the last uh, 50 years or so. Yeah. Uh, we have not had this kind of enthusiasm about the swearing-in of a president. Uh, that number of people who showed up to watch the swearing-in of Barack Obama is unprecedented. That, that was yeah. huge. So, uh, obviously, people want to celebrate, and they are in a festive mood, and uh, they uh, they want this. Uh, there's very few people like you calling radio programs and saying, wouldn't it have been a good idea to have spent the money other ways? Sure, yeah, it would yeah, be. I, but I, I, understand, I understand that. I know, I know the... You know, does the, he really want to come off as, as dour as Jimmy Carter? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm just a plain old peanut farmer, and uh, I'm just gonna come in here with my dopey brother. And we're just gonna like be like normal people. People don't want that. They want the president to be a rock star. Oh, absolutely. And I, yeah, I understand the times we live in, but but how great of a you know how great of a a statement would it have been to say you know you know this or that or try to save it wherever possible? Is what I'm saying. Like I said, I was an Obama supporter, so I was just kind of curious about that. And um, one other thing I wanted to bring up on the air, um, I know we kind of, I know the historical significance of, of, of having the first African American president, and I think we all kind of know at this point that he's he's of some mix. When and where did it all? Did he become just African American? Well, here's the bottom line: as any black you know, person will tell you, if you're one eighth black, you're black, as far <laughs> as most people are concerned. Certainly in terms of discrimination and in terms of racism over the years, you don't have to be very black to start feeling the effects of discrimination. 
<laughs> so if you can be a victim of discrimination for being one eighth black, why can't you be black when something good happens to you, like you become the president? I understand and, what they're saying. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, I don't. It doesn't make a difference to me either way. He can be whatever color he wants to be. <laughs> yeah. You know, if he does a good job, he does a good job. I think that's the most important thing. I just thought it was if somewhere along the line he just became that. And I was just kind of curious is, is if there was a time where we just noticed it go away. He'd be the first to tell you he's black and he's white. I mean, he's not the one going up there going, hey, I'm black. <laughs> it's what other people ascribe to him. Yeah, absolutely. And I, well, I, I know how the force that the media is. They can make you anything they want you to be if they say it enough times in the public. Well, <laughs> it's the media, but it's also the people. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, last night I was watching TNT. And they had, uh, of course, as you know, Martin Luther King had a dream. His dream was that African Americans would sit home all day watching three NBA games in a row to honor <laughs> Reverend Martin Luther King. That was his dream. And so all night on TNT, they're interviewing African American basketball players about the significance of Barack Obama uh, becoming president. Uh, and they threw in Phil Jackson and a couple of token white guys. But let's face it. Primarily, they were in a sport that has a majority of players who are African-American. And they weren't doing this on the National Hockey League last night, asking uh, hockey yeah. players what this means. Uh, they weren't doing this uh, with white football players uh, during the playoff games over the weekend. Uh, they were doing this with the largely black uh, NBA populace, asking what they thought about this. So, believe me, that's the way people see Barack Obama. Yeah, I just thought that, I just thought that was funny. I didn't, I actually, I didn't hear I didn't hear I, I didn't hear Karan Butler or Kobe Bryant on the TNT broadcast last night going, "Well, hey, the guy's also white." Yeah, you didn't hear anybody call him a white president who happens to be half black. <laughs> I, I I was also watching yesterday here in L.A. I was watching uh, just because I had the day off yesterday because it was Martin Luther King Day. Um, I was watching the Martin Luther King parade on Channel Seven yesterday. Because it was early, and I just, I, I would never miss an event like that on television. Yeah. And uh, just about everybody who was there was wearing some Obama hat or talking about Obama. There was very little conversation about Martin Luther King. It was all about Obama. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't hear people at the Martin Luther King parade going, well, you know, the guy's actually half white. Yeah. Have, you ever, have you ever seen a more marketable president either? No. I mean, they, they, they look, right now, this is the best day of his life because... Right now, his approval is at its zenith. The only way he can have a higher approval rating is if he fixes the economy. And even if he fixes the economy, that's not going to happen in three months. That's going to take years. Oh, yeah. It's just, you, you can't, I mean, being in Southern California, about every fifth shirt you see is an Obama shirt, especially right about now. Oh. You know, just had the inauguration and everything, and you say somebody's making a fortune off of this guy. You'll mark my words, and I'm an Obama supporter who voted for him. In about three to six months, you're going to start hearing people going, things didn't get better. We voted for the guy, and things didn't get better. All right, we're all Obama all the time at 1 800 5800 Tom. It's 1 800 5800 866. The Tom Likas Show.